Did you come here to give him thanks and praise this morning? Yeah. Amen. That's why we are here. Well, I get to do your call to worship this morning, so mine's going to be real short and sweet. I'm going to read you out of Psalm 66. It says, shout for joy to God, all the earth. Are you ready to shout for joy to God? Are you ready to shout for joy to God? He is so worthy. He deserves it because of his kindness. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Are you here to give glorious praise to his name? Lord, we are here to worship you. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. That is the power of our God. Amen? Amen. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. Come this morning and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds towards the children of man. Bless our God, O peoples, and let the sound of his praise be heard. God, I pray that you just lead us with your kindness, God, into your presence this morning. I pray, Lord, that anything that we may have come in with, in the name of Jesus, that it has to go. And I pray for a freedom here in worship, God, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, and we, we just love you and we worship you. And we ask for your presence here this morning as we lift you up and we praise you because you are God and you are worthy. And I pray that your name would be glorified in this place this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Are you ready to praise? All right. Samantha said, are you ready to let God hear your praises? Well, don't make him go. What? All right. Be loud. You guys ready? Are you sure? All right. Here we go. Ready? Let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord.
wish we had another fast song now. Let's do it again. No, I'm joking.
one more time. And uh, let's just make this a prayer to our God. And it's a hard prayer to pray if you don't mean it. Or if you do mean it. So I hope you do mean it. Here we go. Lord. At this time, we just want to make our altars open. If there's anything that you need prayer for, it doesn't matter if you've come up a hundred times for the same thing. If there's something you need prayer for, please just know that these altars are open. Please know that we have people that love and care about you. They want to pray with you. They want to agree with you in prayer. They want to plead the blood of Jesus over you in prayer this morning. Receive his reward. I plead the 
know there's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus. And we can claim that power over and over again because of what he's done. We can plead the blood of Jesus over every situation in our lives and in our families, in our communities and things going on around us in the world. We can plead the blood of Jesus because he is above all things. Amen. And he is in Jesus and in his blood. Do we use it? Are you ready to use it this morning, church? You don't have to come up front. You can sit where you are if you need to. But plead the blood of Jesus over the things in your life. Plead the blood of Jesus over your family that needs him so desperately. Plead the blood of Jesus over your children. Plead the blood of Jesus over your neighbor, over Faith Outreach Center, over our, our community and the counties around us.
We're going to go into prayer real quick here, but before we do, can I give a praise report? Praise reports really increase our faith, amen? We prayed for my dad for his hip surgery last week. When we had his surgery, was it Friday? And um, dad, will you do some jumping jacks? No, oh, he's not here. I'm just fooling you. He wouldn't come. <laughs> But uh, my brother and I, we got to go with our mom and dad up uh, to Fort Wayne. And uh, don't tell him. But anyway, he's a coward when it comes to surgeries. <laughs> and he's never really had any. He's never had any surgeries. And so all the things was going through his head. I don't know what TV shows he was watching. I don't know. But you know, that really feeds into it, right? Anyway, uh, he went into that, and we were just having fun with him, talking with him, and, and laughing in the, the hospital staff there. It was just fantastic. Anyway, the doctor came in. He goes, that was a fantastic surgery. It went just great, and it was really quick, and it's just unbelievable. And then when Dad came back, and they took him up to the room, they didn't put him under. They did a, what's called a spinal block, and they gave him a little bit of stuff to make him a little bit of loopy. But, um, but when he came back, he was like... My goodness, he was so cheerful, so happy, and he's just moving his leg around. I said, Dad, should you be like, I don't know, moving that thing? Let the glue set for a little while, man. And uh, he just kept moving that thing, and he was all happy and all giddy. I, I would love to show you a picture, but he didn't want to come today because he didn't want you guys all poking at him. So anyway, <laughs> praise the Lord. God moved in the way. I praise the Lord for the wonderful doctors. I praise the Lord for the technology that we have in the hospitals and the good, good care. We are blessed here in America, are we not? Praise the Lord. So praise the Lord. We want to pray for one more person, at least, and maybe you have a prayer request. Matter of fact, we're going to give it an opportunity for us to pray for each other. But this is Judy Yoakum. How many of you guys know our Judy Yoakum? Well, anyway, she's having knee surgery. Uh, can you tell me, is it total one or two or just one knee? Okay. Uh, she's having a knee surgery, which is this Tuesday, so we want to be praying for her. Uh, I saw someone pointing to somebody up here. Oh, Judy, you're here. Well, come on. <laughs> come on, girl. Can you come up here? Okay. All right, we'll just do right here in the front row. Praise the Lord. If we can have some people come around and just lay hands on this girl. She's wanting to spread these things apart. She's, they're going to do the other one in about six weeks. So, praise the Lord. God, you give peace. You give peace when the world says, be afraid. You give peace when the rest of the world is full of anxiety and worry and doubt. Hallelujah, Lord God. Your presence is our peace. <laughs> and I pray your presence today in our sister Judy right now, in Jesus' name, in her heart. Her mind, enemy, you cannot have her imaginations. Hallelujah. The imaginations belongs to the Lord. Her imaginations belongs to the Holy Spirit who will give you things that he wants to do. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for that. I pray your touch to be upon Judy's knees right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that you would impart healing to these knees. Lord, we know that we have good doctors. We have good hospitals. But, Father God, you are the great physician I pray, God, that she would be able to walk into that place and say, there is no need for surgery. Our God is a creative God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is a loving God. And he had made you, and he's made you wonderfully and perfectly. So, God, I thank you for that. And, Lord, we just pray that you would receive the glory in all this. In Jesus' name. God, and if it should go to the surgeon, we thank you, Lord God, for the good surgeons that are here. Dr. Sheedy, we pray for you right now. We pray for uh, uh, just wisdom and the skills and the talents you've already been working at. They would just go perfectly and flawlessly. But I pray also that you would know the Jesus that Judy knows. I don't know your heart. I don't know. But we just pray for you right now and every single one that's in that room. In Jesus' wonderful name. And Lord, there's some that are here today that need a touch from you. If that is you, just put your hand on your heart right now. God, I just pray right now that you bring healing and, and wholeness into these bodies. Bring healing and wholeness into the minds of people as well. Bring healing and wholeness into the hearts and the emotions. In Jesus' name, God, bring total victory in their lives, Lord. We serve a God who loves us today. And no matter what, in any situation, what it may be, your God is with you. He has never left you. 
He never will. He'll never forsake you. His promises are true yesterday, today, and they're true forever. So, Lord God, thank you for those things. But, Lord, in all this, you said that we would encounter hard times. We would encounter all kinds of different difficult things. But, Lord God, you are working in those things for our good. You're working to grow us. You're working in them to bring us to a, a deeper relationship with you because, Lord God, that's greater than anything else. That's what we're going to take with us forever. We're not taking these bodies with us, that's for sure. But God's given us new bodies. But, Lord God, you love these bodies today. You love these. matter of fact, you inhabit our hearts. And I pray, Lord God, for your touch upon every single one in here today that needs your healing, that needs your presence, that needs your power, that needs your words spoken over them right now. Receive in Jesus' name. Let your faith rise up in what God has already done in his word. Remember, everything in the Bible is your testimony. Amen. And we have testimonies that are around us as well. Our God is still working. He's still in the miracle working business. No other body, nobody else can. So thank you, God, for your touch on these lives, on these hearts, on these families, these relationships. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah. We bless your name. Amen. 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 You guys may be seated. Don't, don't go anywhere. We're not going to greet yet, but go ahead and have a seat. We have something else we want to go. You guys can still be like, you know, pray pretty stuff. I don't know. Play pretty stuff. Say, you guys play pretty stuff? <laughs> uh, hey, actually, if we could, could you bring up all the lights? Because we want everyone to see what we're getting ready to do. All righty. We're going to go to that, my slideshow. It's, uh, it's about membership. If you would, please. Today, um, we are bringing in some families as members of our church. And what does that mean? Does that mean you get a card? Nah. Does it mean you get special privileges? Nah. Uh, does that mean you're in a family that loves you? Oh, yeah. We love you. We love you very, very much. We don't really push membership. Matter of fact, we only do it once a year. We do it once a year. What we do, we say, hey, if you're interested in what does Faith Outreach Center believe, take this class. Who is Foursquare? Where do they come from? What do they believe? Take the class. And then out of that, and plus the fact that they've been part of this family for some time, that they decided, I want to commit. Say commit. I want to commit myself to this body of believers. By the way, Church everywhere is the body of Jesus Christ, is it not? It is the body of Jesus Christ. So I want to give you four reasons for being a church member. Sounds like a great joke, doesn't it? Okay, anyway. First of all, it is biblical. The term member is not used in the Bible, but the concept of commitment certainly is throughout the Bible. In Philippians 1.5, Paul wrote this. I thank my God for your partnership in the gospel. So being a member of a church is you're partnering with what God is doing in that body right there. Hallelujah. Philip's, uh, Philippi's committed people were what caused the church to succeed everywhere they went. It was, if one man, one woman cannot do it, amen? So that was there. Yes, it is biblical. It's very biblical. Uh, church membership, it's not a club. It's a family. A family that is committed to each other. It's committed to the Lord, amen, first and foremost. And committed to the Word of God, but committed to each other as well. A family where you're known. A family where you're loved. And a family where you also are cared for. We want to care for you. So, by other Christians. So, number one, it is biblical for membership. Number two, it gives stability. See, the church is on the front lines of spiritual warfare all over the place. It is. And lots of times we forget that we're in a war. But I want you to know you have an enemy. You also have a culture in which you are not a part of. God has called us out of that culture. Amen? Has he not? Are you different from the world? 
Okay, maybe. Uh, you, you need to be different from the world. And when I say world, I'm not talking about the wonderful things that's going on. I'm talking about the world system of uh, going after itself, worshiping itself, uh, uh, the things of the flesh. We're talking about those things. It's not wrong to be part of a country or anything like that, but I'm just saying there is a world uh, uh, culture that pulls away from God. It doesn't love God. You are part of a different people. You're a different. God has called you as his own. So anyway, we are on the front lines of a spiritual battle. For church to be successful, there we go, people need to si step up. Say step up to higher levels of commitment. And membership is a high level of commitment. It's a calling to God. It's a calling to each other. The third thing is this. Church membership provides accountability. Being a church attender is not the same as being a church member. We, we love that you attend, but the church members is we, we are in each other's lives. Okay, now you're thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> but listen, we are in each other's lives. And it's not like we're supposed to go out and call out everything. We're supposed to encourage each other to go after God. We're encourage each other to do good things unto the Lord. Amen? That is what the membership is for. That's what family is for. Family members encourage each other. Sometimes we bite each other. Sometimes we hack each other down. That's the wrong way. That's the wrong type of family. Amen? But we're called to commit to each other and to hold each other accountable. We love each other. Accountability is a necessary aspect of the Christian life, and members help to ensure that that happens. For everyone in the church, there's nothing like knowing people that have skin in the game. If you're part of this church, you've got skin in the game. I want to be a part of what God is doing there. And finally, the fourth one is this. It benefits you. Being a member of a church, it benefits you. Membership is a defining moment in your Christian walk. Hey, I've given my heart to Jesus. I want him to know I love his family. Or at least I'm working on loving his family. Right? I love his family. And I love being a part of his family. And I want what God wants me to do. And God has called us to be a family as well. Membership is a defining moment in the Christian walk. You take your commitment to Jesus serious enough to make a commitment to Jesus' church in a local place. In a local place. Membership is making commitment and, a com uh, and communicating it in a very public way. That's what we're doing up here. By the way, let me just say this. Successful people are just ordinary people who make commitments. We live in a culture today that doesn't want to be committed to each other. They don't want to be committed into a, a, a relationship like a marriage. They just rather just, let's just live together. That's, that's not what God wants. God wants people who are committed and love and do things together. Amen? And that's also within the spiritual family of Jesus Christ. We're committed not only to God, but we're also committed to each other. That's why we do things together. That's why, why we like to play together and have fun together. By the way, how many of you guys came last night to the uh, Redeemed Banquet? Man, wasn't that fun? They can give you a, they give you a, a update on it, and I don't want to steal that from them. But today, we, uh, we appreciate those who say, hey, I want to be a part of the Family of Faith Outreach Center. I want to, I want to be in tune with what you guys are doing. I want to be used in the church. Hallelujah. You know, by the way, God has given every single believer a spiritual gift. And you know where you use those the most? In the church. Spiritual gifts. He, you use those in the church. And that encourages everyone else to say, I want to go after God in a greater and deeper way. That's what changed my life. I saw someone who went after God with all their heart, and I said, I want to be like him. And the Holy Spirit gave me that desire. Praise the Lord for that. So, Faith Outreach Center membership. We are so blessed to have several families joining this body today. Matter of fact, what we're going to do, we're going to have you guys come on up here so everyone can see you. Actually, no. I don't want you up here. <laughs> We're going to do it right down here in the front row. All right. The first family we want to call up is Isaiah and Ann Smith. Will you guys come on up with your family? <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Are missing one but anyway this is Ann and Isaiah Smith uh, this is Sawyer and Paisley how you doing Paisley she's a wallflower okay <laughs> uh, Isaiah you uh, you're an owner of a car lot there in Fulton it's still dead if you guys want to need a good deal on a car I bet he can give you bet beat anybody else's deal <laughs> anyway and 
and she is a physical therapist, and they both live in, am I correct in saying that? Assistant, okay, well, hey, she's, she's better than the other one. They both live, they live east of Akron, they come here, and Anne and Kyle, Anne, you are the sister of Kyle Town, right? Kyle Town, are you here, or do you want to make that known? Okay, anyway. But anyway, please welcome the, uh, the Smith family. Tanya Flores. Tanya, come on up here, girl. Let me tell you something about Tanya. Number one, she is a sweet, sweet lady. Come here, girl. She took this uh, uh, course uh, last, last, last year. I said, you want to be a member? She goes, Let's, let me think about it. So she's been thinking a long time. And we're glad you came to a decision. She lives in Rochester. She works with Don and Mary Kay Town at the Ann's Bargain Barn, which is part of all this as well. Uh, she's a shy girl. She loves the Lord. She, and one of the things that really define her, she really loves children. Uh, you'll find her back there with your kids all the time. And Tanya is a, here's something else. Tanya is a massive prayer warrior. I learned it. Yeah, look at this. I know things. So anyway, <laughs> she is a massive prayer warrior. If you need a prayer, uh, she will pray for you. She's not a publicly, public person. She's not one who stands up in front of people, but she is a prayer warrior, and she will check up on you, and she hears about your prayer request and that, how God answered it. She goes, oh, praise the Lord. I've been praying about that. You may have forgotten about it. She hasn't. So thank you, Tanya. Welcome. <laughs> Next, we have Rex and Lori Holloway. Come on up. Come on down. All right, these guys, they live, let's see, you guys live in the Silver Lake area, am I correct? North Manchester, oh wow, they, they travel a long ways, I don't know. We have a lot of people who travel from a long ways. We need to really get after Rochester people, amen? <laughs> but I'm so glad they came. You guys probably meet them now and then at the front as they welcome people. They love to be used by the Lord. They love to be part of the church family where they can use their giftings and use their skills as well. Lori, you're, already, you're a retired nurse, right? All right. And Rex, he's working for the, U, uh, no, the, the post office. Are you still there? And you're in the process of retiring. Ten months to go and counting down. They're very, very family-oriented. As a matter of fact, she's still a part of social media for the sole reason so she can keep up with all of her grandchildren. Is that correct? All right. Well, welcome. We're glad to have you guys. Next, we have Dan and Diane Spore. Come on down. This couple, they live in the Akron area. Do you guys live in Akron or Athens? Athens. They're Athenians. Okay, all right. This family here have eight kids. Eleven. I uh, 11 grandkids and three great-grandkids. Dan, right now, he, he's a retired from Sunoco there in Akron, but right now, if you need a car ride, he's your man. He works with Transpo. Ask for him by name. Do you get, do you get bonuses for that? Okay, all right. Uh, Diane, uh, she manages, she's a manager. She has managed several different businesses. She's always in management. She's a chamber director here in Rochester, director of the Chamber of Commerce. Am I saying that right? All right. Was. Okay. She managed Arby. She managed other things. She takes care of the... Oh, and her biggest, biggest job right now is taking care of a pile of grandkids at her house. So will you please welcome the Spores. <laughs> Next is Jeremy... Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah and Leanne Hunter. Are you guys here? Oh, there they are. Come on down. And all your kids, too. By the way, Leanne here, she is the mother of Diane and Dan right over there. That is their parents, yes. Oh, no, she's a daughter. Boy, doesn't she look great? What's her secret? I had... <laughs> I'm sorry, you're the daughter. <laughs> and, <laughs> 
They also live in Athens. And uh, by the way, her husband, Jeremiah, he's not able to be here today, but he is a Georgia boy, is he not? And a major Bulldogs fan. So if you want to get on this family's good side, love the, uh, the Georgia Bulldogs. Okay. We also have Mackenzie. Where are you at, girl? We have Madison. We have Jackson. We have Brittley. And we have Levi. There you guys are. And by the way, these kids also... These kids love to help grandma in the garden as well. So if you guys need some garden work or weeds pulled, this is the family right here. Welcome. All right, next we want to welcome Paul and Sherry Penix. Come on over. Let me tell you something. The moment they, oh, sorry. The moment they walked into this church, it's just like they belonged. It's just, it's just unbelievable. Uh, Paul, this guy is a jack of all trades. He started out as an iron worker, working on those. He became an archery salesman, loved that kind of stuff, radio personality. And if you ever need a cartoon voiceover, that is your man right there. I kid you not. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> and he won't stop either. So, anyway... This guy works with the kids. He works with your kids back there. So if they're enjoying that, he is one of the reasons why they're doing that. Uh, Sherry. Sherry is a huge part of the Embrace Grace ministry that is here at Faith Outreach Center. Am I saying that right? <laughs> Something happened. I missed it. All right. All right. <laughs> She's a huge part of the Embrace Grace. She's the head facilitator, and she also runs all the classes of the Embrace Grace. So will you please welcome the Penix family? All righty. Next is Fred and Allie Schaffner. Also with them is their daughter. Now, you guys live in Rochester, correct? All right. We're good. Let me tell you just a little bit about them. How you doing, girl? This is Hannah. Thank you. It's Hannah. I am sorry, girl. How you doing? All right. By the way, um, let me just tell you a little bit about Allie. She has this newfound love of reading books, and she is part of the book, church book club that is here <laughs> in Rochester at this church. So, uh, Also, she is an aide that works at the schools, Columbia School. All right. Welcome there. And Fred, he works at Bronze in Winnemac, and he has and grows epic beards. So will you please welcome <laughs> the Shafter family? <laughs> Uh, Becky Young. Come on over, girl. All right, Becky, she lives here in Rochester, and uh, she is a, what she said is a beginning herbalist. Did I say that word right? Her Hannah, right? All right, she's a beginning herbalist. And uh, Becky is also a fixer-upper. Uh, I, I heard about her skills in working on her house, building on her house, making it better, doing all types of improvement. She says that was out of necessity because she could not afford to hire anybody else. So she, uh, she takes care of that, and she's a very, very sweet girl who's hungry for the Lord. Uh, she's a part of, uh, she's here Wednesday nights, the spiritual things, hungry for the spiritual things of God. So I, it's one of the things I've noticed about her right away. So please welcome Becky. We have two other families that are joining, but they couldn't be here today, and that, uh, that is Sam and Elena Adams, and they have two beautiful kids, uh, and also Laster and Kanda Boggs. They were not able to be here today, but these are. So uh, I want you guys to turn around. We're going to put something up there on the screen. And this is, go ahead and go to the next slide if you would, please. This is, a, this is a kind of the covenant that we ask people to take with the church. Remember. It's all about covenant relationship. That's a little bit more than just saying a club where I come and go whenever I want. It's like I'm part of you guys. I want to be part of your family. It's like adoption. But it says this. Having received Jesus as my Lord and my Savior and been baptized and being in agreement with Faith Outreach Center's statements, strategy, and structure, I now feel led by the Holy Spirit to unite with the Faith Outreach Center family. And in doing so, I, could my, I commit myself to God and to the other members to do the following things. Let's go to the next slide. These are the things. I will protect the unity of the church. And how you protect the unity of the church, and listen, all of us need to re review these, amen? And that is by acting in love towards other members, by refusing to gossip, and by following the leaders as they follow the Lord. 
Amen. We're not here to just say, follow us. Not, not, nothing like that at all. There's nothing. But this is how you have unity in the church. The second thing, I will share the responsibility of my church. It's not just a one-person thing. It's everybody. We do that by praying for its growth. And when I say growth, we're not just talking like new members coming. We're talking about people being saved. Amen? I will pray for its growth. That's how I'll share the responsibility. By inviting the unchurched to attend and by warmly welcoming those who visit this church. I, if you visit this church, I hope you are overwhelmed with hugs. So the next thing is this. I will serve the ministry of my church. How do you do that? First, by discovering the many gifts and talents that you have. God gives us spiritual gifts. God wants to use those things in this church. And you guys have talents. The next thing is this. By being equipped to serve by my pastors. In other words, we want to pour into you the word of God. And by developing a servant's heart. That is one of the biggest things for a church family. Can I tell you, that's what's one of the things that makes it so different from anything else. Is a servant's heart. And finally, the fourth thing is this. Next slide, please. I will support the testimony of my church. And we do that by attending faithfully by living a godly life, and by giving regularly. So these are the things that they've said they commit, and they want to be a part of this church. So let's pray. You guys can turn back around now. <laughs> we want to see your faces. Heavenly Father, if you guys stretch forth your hand, thank you for these that you've planted with us. Why? It's because, God, you have a purpose for your church. You have a calling for this church to minister to people in this community. And, Lord, you're bringing people's hearts together for that. You're bringing different skill sets, different talents, different gifts. Thank you, Father God, for bringing these here. We love them, Lord. We, we embrace them. We thank you, Lord, that we're all in the same family with all the other churches. But, Lord, we thank you that we're going to minister together here. Lord, I just pray your blessings upon them. I pray that they would always feel welcome, that we would grow, that this church would grow in unity. This church would grow in love, not only for the world, but for each other as well. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? All right, at this time, we're going to, why don't you come on up here and give these guys a hug and say, welcome to Faith Outreach Center. This is our greeting time. Kids, you can go right through that door for the kids' church. So welcome to them, church. Hey, um, this week, uh, I, I had surgery again. Again, I had it on my nose. This week, I had it on my eye. They're done cutting. That's the most weight I'm going to lose this summer, okay? So I'm done losing weight. Uh, but I had that and also my dad's uh, uh, surgery I wanted to be part of. So I've asked Eli if he would come and bless us today with the sermon. So would you guys please welcome Eli Hall as he brings us this, today's message. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Cool. Good morning, church family. It's good to see each and every one of you. Pastor Terry told me to give you heaven. So let me tell you something. A year and a half ago, Pastor Terry did this series on Hebrews. And when you walked in here, you smelled this heavenly aroma of kingdom coffee filled this place. Now, this morning, there is no kingdom coffee, but we are going to be looking at Hebrews, and you definitely smell this wonderful aroma of tacos. Um, so this, mo this morning, don't let that distract you, though, from the word that we're about to read this morning. So with all that being said, um, let's pray. Father, we love you so much, God, and I pray, Lord, that as we dig into your word this morning, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you just speak to our hearts and our spirits. I pray, Father, that when we leave today, that we're changed. And I pray, Lord, that you just begin just to minister to each and every one of us, God, I pray, Lord, that you just give me the words to speak. In your name we pray, amen. So this past week, um, just praying, I'm like, Lord, what in the world, what direction do we go? And I still want to talk on holiness, but I felt like the Lord kept speaking to me, sanctification, which is kind of like holiness in a way. And when I start thinking on holiness, I kind of think about um, the ultimate good. Where do we get the ultimate good from? Jesus, right? It's our salvation with the Lord. It is the righteousness of God that can live inside of us. And so I think when we talk about holiness, that's where we start, is our relationship with God. And uh, the Christian life is a lot like uh, a strenuous 
race, right? Now, I have never been a runner, right? One time I did it, and it wasn't for me, okay? I did cross country one year, and it wasn't for me. Uh, But I definitely remember seeing people all around us, and I kind of want to share a little bit about that later on. But oftentimes when it comes to a big race, it's long, it's rewarding, and even difficult at times, right? There's a lot of preparation that comes into running a race. And for you and I, our end goal is to pursue Christ with everything in us. And there's definitely a lot of discipline along with that. Along the process, there's discipline. And there's also determination included with that. And so there's not very many people that I know of that can wake up one morning and say, man, I'm going to go run a marathon. (laughs) Unless, unless... Your name is Bob and Stacy Lyon or Leslie Weichel. They're some of the only people that I even came in contact that can run marathons or half marathons, right? Um, but for the average Joe, the average person is going to take time to prepare, to condition themselves for a race. It's kind of like Bob was talking to Bob this morning. He's like, yeah, if I'm preparing for a marathon, man, I'm just running 10 miles a day at least. I'm like, man, for me, I'm, I'm lucky to enough bicycle 10 miles, right? Much less run. Uh, But it definitely takes determination uh, and especially discipline too. And so when running the Christian race of life and chasing after holiness, we should strive for steadiness, right? It's a daily thing that we should be looking forward to. And there's also persistency, right? You're going to see sometimes, um, I guess in a race, you're going to see people that are going to burst off and you're going to see them Uh, over time get so tired, right? Then you've got some people that are going to set their own pace where they know that they can succeed. And I think for you and I, especially in the race of life, we should definitely be consistent with our walk with the Lord. Interesting enough, as Paul shares in Corinthians that we run a race, and race, and uh, in the Greek, is agon, which we get agony. I'm like, man, that makes so much sense, right? Because I don't like running, right? It is no fun. If you think it's fun, you're crazy, right? But (laughs) again, uh, John MacArthur said, a race is not a thing of passive luxury, but it's demanding, grueling, and agonizing, and requires self-discipline, determination, and perseverance. And I'm like, that outlines so much with the Christian walk. There's perseverance, there's determination that we walk with Christ every single day. Chasing holiness requires us to have uh, discipline. Holiness is having that relationship with Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us every single day. Though having that relationship with the Lord, the Lord uh, speaks to our heart and starts working on our heart every single day and our motives. And it's going to be difficult, but it's also rewarding. And that's part of chasing that holiness. First Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? so that you may run to obtain it. And so therefore, you and I should all be striving to run the race for the end goal is eternity with Jesus in eternal life. Paul describes himself as an athlete competing for the prize of the crown in eternity. And his point is for us to pursue godliness and the good of others. Along this training in life, we also deal with disciplining our bodies. Hebrews 12, 11, for the moment of all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. And I think even as believers in our walk, we're definitely going to go through hardships, right? There's definitely going to become times in our life where we know that we're comfortable in sin and we got to get rid of it, right? That's part of that discipline that the Lord starts to work on us and later on we begin to see that fruit. So how can we maintain a mindset of endurance and perseverance on our Christian journey? Uh, If we're called to run the race of life and chase holiness, don't be that guy that just stands there. And oftentimes in our life, it's like we accept Christ. Some of us accept Christ in our life, and that's it. That's it. No, we have to definitely be walking by the Spirit every single day. We have to be willing to surrender to Him. So... um, 
I want to watch this real quick clip. Um, it kind of involves a race a second because this is definitely us sometimes. Story. Yeah, it looked like a coronation for Tanche Pepio. He's getting the crowd. He wants the crowd to cheer his performance. And at the end, he gets pipped. He gets pipped by Marin Simon of Washington. And you just can't do this kind of stuff, Lewis. You can. And you know, you see his face. And you know, no one has to say anything. They don't have to explain it to him. He'll never make that mistake again. We don't want to be that guy, right? He started celebrating way too early and just stops, right? He starts celebrating. And I feel like oftentimes in our life, if we're not careful, we definitely do that as well, right? We accept Christ and we just stop. But no, the Holy Spirit wants to see us fulfill our life, right? He wants to see us walk by spirit every single day. And oftentimes in our life, after surrendering to Christ, we tend to stop seeking God and we stop living a life that is sold out to God. Because life is tough, we start to lose sight of the crown. We don't want to be that guy, right? So a little bit about the background of Hebrews. Uh, it kind of talks about Jesus as being greater than any angel or priest or any old covenant practice. Jews were kind of contemplating. Again, they were set freed by receiving the gospel. And now at this time, they were willing to go back to their old habits, the sacrifices, the different rituals, the different things that they used to be required before Christ. And as Christians, we must not forsake the great salvation that Jesus has already brought about us. And so this is exactly what this letter was saying. Hey, look, we got to remember what Christ did for us. He's the high priest. We don't want to go back into those old routines. So Hebrews has two primary purposes, uh, and I thought these were really good. Number one, to encourage Christians to endure, right? Even through different trials, tribulations, even throughout our daily life, to keep enduring Christ. And number two, to warn others not to abandon their faith in Christ. And through that, we definitely are checking in on each other and being the body of Christ. And so as we're talking about running a race or, or chasing holiness, I want to start with number one, strive with awareness. So we're going to be looking at Hebrews 12, uh, 12 through 13. It says this, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths to your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. When pursuing holiness, ultimately... It comes from our relationship with Christ, right? Because he's the righteousness that we need. We're not a fan of, our family's not really a fan of participation trophies. In fact, um, this was one time Sarah got a fifth place ribbon. She won't bring this up, but she's like, no, I don't want that. Throw it in the trash. It's not good enough, right? But here's the truth is that you and I, as we're running this race, we definitely get a participation trophy somewhat because Christ has already won for you and I. We get the crown of life, but it doesn't mean that we should just stop running, right? We've got to be daily living by the Spirit of God. And Jesus is the winner because he's already defeated sin and death for you and I. He paid the ultimate price for you and I by dying on the cross. And that's where we get the holiness in our life. And so if we surrender our life to Christ, we know that we get the crown of life for eternity. But we still have to run the race, right? We still got to participate in order to get the crown of life. We still have to surrender to the Lord. We still have to do life no matter what. Too often times our mindset is because I have Christ, every single day is going to be sunshine and great weather. But the reality is, we're still running this race, even if there's rain and an overcast day, right? It's not very fun, but the truth is, is we still got to run it. Because the assurance is that we all know that we're going to receive the crown of life. And as the body of Christ, we also support each other to strengthen the weak knees. Everyone is accountable for their own actions, but we can still support each other. So are you aware, here's a question for you, are you aware of how your neighbor is doing? Can you reach out to them? Just this morning, I was talking to John Wooten, and he mentioned uh, too many times, it's time for the church to get out of their own bubble. And I feel like that is so true, that we have to be willing to check in on each other, to strengthen each other, especially with the walk of life, right? Because there's definitely times, in our, there's hardships in our life 
where sometimes people want to give up on God because they're going through a trial and tribulation, and that's when we can be interceding for them and encourage them. The truth is, people have problems, people have stories, and we need to reach out. And so, so many times, whether it's your neighbor, it may even be the person next to you. Guess what? You can check in on them, right? We can get outside of our bubble to get to know each other, see what's going on in their life. Galatians 6, 2 says this, bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. Burden means a weight, a weight of personal internal significance. It can kind of refer to a character flaw, a struggle, or a moral requirement. Again, everyone struggles with something. Galatians 6, 5 says, for each will have to bear his own load. So this load refers to an individual burden that is not transferable. And so this is how Eli pictures it. Maybe you're over here lifting this huge thing. Maybe, let's say Mark below me has to lift this 300 pound rock up for whatever reason, right? And he's starting to struggle. If I'm walking by him, am I gonna come over here and say, hey, Mark, let me take that for you. I wish. No, I'm gonna come (laughs) underneath him to support that rock too, right? And that's the reality. When we bear each other's burdens, we still go through it, right? We still go through life. There's nothing that can change that, but we can be there to support each other. Um, We have an obligation that we're not, we alone are not responsible. Yeah, so although the supportive one does not assume the whole load, he helps him and allows the struggling one to carry out this destination. So therefore, it would be like Mark still having to lift that rock. I don't just take it from him, but I come beneath him to help support him. And I think that's exactly what we're called to do, to bear one another's burdens. Hebrews 12, 12 says, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. It kind of describes the attitude of the individual who is discouraged and encourages the the believer to keep pressing on even in the hard times. So when you overcome hardships, it's a testimony to other believers, right? So when you're able to overcome it, if I'm seeing Mark overcoming this huge rock, it's going to inspire me as well. And oftentimes when it comes to chasing that holiness, we're checking in on other people as well and coming behind them. It can be a testimony to other people. Just as in a race, uh, when the individual wants to give up, they're motivated by seeing others around them. Again, this this morning, I was talking to Bob, and he was telling me his main goal isn't necessarily to win, but he's there to encourage others around him. I'm like, man, that is awesome. That's what I call sportsmanship, right? For a lot of us, we want that number one trophy, right? We want to be first place. And I think even talking to Bob, that was definitely his motive. Like, he wants it, but the reality is it's more important to support others around him whenever they're struggling. Let's watch this next clip right here by both of them oh, another boy. fall oh, Come on. we just all want her to just get there she's given everything she possibly has to get to this finish line she is literally from where we sit we can oh, see boy. she's less than 50 yards from the finish sold a phenomenal athlete and triathlete great runner she's uh, just willing but, herself there uh, and this is this is our winner ladies and gentlemen this is not normally what you expect to see at the finish of a marathon But Chandler Self has run herself to complete exhaustion, and she is so brave. This is incredible. And she's running fast. Remember, she's 30 minutes ahead or slower than what the time is because she started earlier. She is still going to run the marathon in under two hours and 50 minutes. Perfect. That's awesome. Tremendous, tremendous effort for Chandler Self today. That should be our heart, right? Even though in this instant, they're rivals, they're competing against each other. Her knee went out and she was willing to help her out. You can stop the clip now. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, All right, but the reality is we should be bearing one another's burdens, checking in on each other. We, guess what, church? We can be praying for one another. Uh, And in fact, as a church body, we should be doing that, interceding for each other. Um, So basically, if you see somebody struggling, check in on them, get to know them. In these verses, the writer encourages us to be an example to others around us, not to lose hope of Jesus regardless of our circumstances. 
And so when we talk about striving, the next one is going to be strive with peace. But strive um, expresses something of eagerness pursuit. It's something that you're always looking forward to. You keep running towards it. Strive with peace. Uh, strive for peace. Hebrews 12, 14 says, strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness, which no one will see, the Lord. The church as a whole should demonstrate unity coming together together. The church should not only keep peace, but also actively pursue it. And at this time, uh, I guess in the context of this whole entire message or letter, the church at this time was dealing with Jewish persecutors, which led to different opinions inside of the church. And the church as a whole was just to encourage to keep maintaining that peace. The Christians at this time were encouraged to strive for peace, to seek it and pursue it. And I think oftentimes in our life, when you have people, we definitely have different motives, different actions, different thoughts. And there's definitely times when people get offended, right? But we should ultimately come together in unity and create peace between each other. Uh, Psalms 34, 14 says, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And so this kind of just kind of gives us, uh, I guess, two or three, four commands. Turn away from evil, right? Quit doing those things that we know are contrary to the gospel and to the Lord. To do good, seek peace, and pursue after it with our intention. Be intentional about it. And so the reason to pursue it is because peace doesn't necessarily come automatically. It doesn't happen overnight, right? Um, especially if there's a lot of hurt relationships, and so oftentimes, we continue showing peace to those individuals um, because people are people, and we're all broken, right? But the enemy is going to do whatever he can to split up the church, right? Um, he doesn't want us in unity. He doesn't want us unified. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, and I came that I may have life and have it abundantly. I love in Proverbs, it says that the enemy is like a lion. He's clever, right? Tricky. And he's going to do whatever he can to disrupt the body of Christ, especially when they're onto something, right? And they're seeking out the Lord in unison. As believers, chasing holiness, we should strive for peace with others. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgave you, right? And that's one of the biggest, I don't even know how to phrase this, but that's one of the biggest forgivenesses, examples we can even look at, right? Is that Christ forgave you and I. We didn't even deserve it, right? So why can't we forgive other people, even in the church body, right? We're family, right? All right, so uh, hear me out. Um, growing up, and I don't want to really say names because my family may be watching live stream, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> This way. Growing up, we would always go to my grandma's house, and we would have a big meal, Easter, Christmas, and it would be all my siblings, cousins, and all this other bunch of stuff. And normally, when grandma sets a time, everybody had to be there, right? Uh, or else you never know what grandma's going to say, right? And so um, this particular year, if we were eating at 12 o'clock, 12.30 rolled around, 1 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock, we were waiting on my sister to get, oh yeah, I shouldn't have said that, but anyways, <laughs> we were waiting on my, my sister to get there, Well, she finally rolls in from work, but we had already started eating. Oh man, and let me tell you what, that whole family dynamics changed entirely. There was no more peace in that setting, right? Uh, <laughs> And it continued all day, and that's exactly what we don't want, right? We want to be showing forgiveness and make peace with other people. Um, one of the greatest examples we can also look at is even Joseph, right? Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons. His father loved him more than any of his other sons. But his brothers were so jealous of him, they sold him into slavery. Uh, and he was taken into Egypt and eventually became the steward of Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. Uh, Potiphar's wife um, tried unsuccessfully to seduce him. He got thrown into prison and all this other bunch of stuff. He went through so much hardship, but it all turned back around later on when there was a famine in the land and his brothers ended up coming back to him, right? So let me read you this one verse. Uh, Genesis 50, 
um, 19. But Joseph said to him, do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. I love this example because, again, he had every right. I mean, his brothers sold him into slavery. That's pretty wicked, right? <laughs> That's pretty bad, <laughs> Right, but he still showed them forgiveness. And yes, there was a time when uh, he kind of made them beg, let him let him on for a little bit. But the reality is, is he didn't have to choose to forgive them, but he did. And for you and I, I think in order to make that peace um, with other people, also peace so that they come to know the Lord as well. Bitterness is real, but you have the choice to make. Uh, even Christians can have bad attitudes and hurt each other. It's a real thing, right? Uh, we're not perfect people. We're all broken people, right? But that shouldn't stop us from forgiving each other and walking out a life of peace and holiness. And in those moments, we don't want to create hostility to Christianity. There's so many times I talk to different people, and they say that they don't want to be a Christian because they're hurt by other people. And they say, Christians are hypocrites, blah, 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 Right? And so the reality is I think that we should definitely be making that peace uh, with individuals. Uh, Matthew 5, 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, a teaching by Jesus. And so instead of creating division, let's remember that we're all running the race and seeking the crown and checking in on each other. Let's practice a peaceful attitude and a heart with others by showing forgiveness then create, and then instead of creating opportunities for hardened hearts, because if not, you don't solve this issue now, there's going to start becoming a hardened heart in the way, and we don't want that in between them and the Lord as well. Romans 12, 21, it says, do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this kind of scripture kind of explains, hey, look, in order to maintain peace with our enemies, we strive to do good with all men. So to maintain that peace with them, we do good to all men. So my question for you for this one is who in your life needs forgiven? Who in your life needs forgiven? And that's hard, right? Because we definitely build up those walls. But I feel like the Lord is saying, look, I've shown you grace. I've shown you love. So now it's time for you to show love and grace to them. So the next one is strive with holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness which no one will see the Lord. In order for us to understand the idea of holiness, we have to look at what holiness is, right? Holiness and sanctification go hand in hand. And it's only achieved by Christ and his sacrifice for you and I. That's how we receive the righteousness of God. No one can achieve holiness on their own. You and I can't be good people, right? We can't stand before God. We're not good, right? But we know that because God made a way by sending Jesus to die for you and I, now we can receive the righteousness of God. We made right in his eyes. If we stood before God, for the wages of sin is death, but God made a way by sending Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins. So first, in order to maintain holiness, we have to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But the work of the Holy Spirit continues to work on each and every one of us every single day, daily. But we definitely have to be walking in that, right? We have to be listening to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, And by that, for we've all been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. So again, I got to study a little bit on sanctification. Sanctification has two aspects. Number one, believers must keep themselves separated from sin or defilement. Um, if you, might, you might remember, but at one moment, when they were setting up the tabernacle, which is the presence of God, Moses was told to clean all the utensils, right? He wanted, he wanted them, God wanted them to be purified. And so it's so true for you and I. We must keep clean and pure, keep ourselves pure, just like the tabernacle and the temple. So number two, believers must also be devoted and separated to God. So number one, away from sin, right? Number two, devoted to God and pursue him. That's what sanctification is. And so it's daily Christian living, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us saying, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Hey, Eli, you shouldn't be doing that. Eli, hey, do you wanna grow with me? Do you wanna spend time with me developing that relationship? And so oftentimes when it comes to this, I, I begin to think of, 
Uh, my wife and the girls really love planting flowers, okay? Uh, and it's so cute seeing our daughters because they will start planting these flowers and immediately the next day they will go out and look at the window. Is it there yet? No, nope, okay. Is it there yet? No, nope, okay. So then the next day they will go up, look at the window, looking for these flowers, right? Especially Ellie. And then every single day she checks on these flowers and you start seeing it slowly grow. Uh, until eventually she starts seeing the pink flower and she's so excited and then wants to pick it. Um, <laughs> but it's so cute just to see them also going out there and they start seeing weeds, they want to pull it. And I begin to realize that's exactly how you and I should be. When the Lord moves into our life, we should be daily inspecting, daily looking, all right, Lord, what in the world can I get rid of? Are there any weeds in my life? Is there anything in my life that I need to get rid of? And just start seeing the Lord moving in our life. Uh, so to strive for holiness, we want to have a relationship with God by believing that Jesus died for our sins because you can't chase holiness without the grace of God. Remember that. So we want to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our life, daily reflecting, am I bearing the image of Christ in everything I do and everything I say? And so we allow just the Holy Spirit saying, look, Eli, I want you to work in this area. I want you to work on this. So again, daily living by the Holy Spirit, allowing him to speak to us. Am I bearing that image? And the last one uh, I want to speak on is strive with purpose. Hebrews 12, 15 through 16, it says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up, causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. And as the body of Christ, we want to see others in heaven, right? Do you want to see other people in heaven? I sure hope so, right? Um, and experience the grace of God in our life. And that's kind of like why we want to make peace with other people as well and to share the gospel with others. And so the letter was written to the church to encourage them to make peace with everyone. Pursue the holiness so that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. So the author, the author emphasizes to care for others, care for their burdens, right? He doesn't want them to give up on their faith, assure that no one lacks the grace of God. And so Esau is the prime example of falling short because Esau exchanges his privileges and blessings as the eldest son for a single meal. This, I guess, physical um, problem for, I guess, eternal, like eternal things. So these blessings. And so oftentimes, um, his physical hunger took priority over his spiritual blessings. Our spiritual blessings is that we may not have like a, I guess like a spiritual blessing in the same sense, but guess what we do have? We have the spiritual blessing of Jesus dying for us, right? And so we can have eternal life. We can receive the crown of life because Jesus died for us. And even when life gets hard, we don't want to trade that. Because so many times there's definitely people that says, look, life is getting hard. I'm done serving the Lord. I'm done. Uh, because again, I thought it was going to be about sunshine. Everything was going to be perfect. But it's not true, right? We're going to go through hardships. Sometimes there's people that receive Christ and think life will be easy. But the truth is, it's constant discipline and it's hard, right? Uh, I know it's very comforting. But sometimes people receive, experience hurt from even believers uh, sometimes those people turn their back on God and give up their internal inheritance and their relationship with God because they would rather live in the moment. And so I just encourage each and every one of us to be seeking out people. How in the world can we encourage other people, if, especially if you know somebody's going through a hard time, especially if you know that there's a disagreement between people? Hey, let's check in on them. Let's try to seek that forgiveness and that peace. And so for the church, I would say, hey, make peace and show forgiveness to everyone because we want to see everyone in heaven, right? Uh, to the struggling believer, step into the grace of God. He will sustain you. He cares about your needs. But also, get plugged in too. Um, again, I think a perfect example, and I, just because I've only been to the men's group, I've never been to the women's group, right? Uh, when I've gone to a prayer group, I'm like, hey, these are my needs. Guess what the men do? They pray, right? 
Do they take my responsibility and do stuff for me? No, (laughs) right? But they definitely give me some wisdom and advice and they pray for me. And that's exactly what the church should be doing, right? Uh, And remember that we're all broken people. But don't allow your temporary situations dictate where you spend eternity. So we're all running a race and we have to strive and pursue the Lord in everything we do. First of all, it comes from eternal life with Jesus, and that's where we want to be. But luckily, God made a way for you and I. Again, Romans 10, 9. Uh, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. And that's what the gospel is, right? Believing that Jesus is the holiness for our life, the righteousness. And so we move forward. It doesn't stop once we receive salvation, but there's a continuation of the Holy Spirit moving in our life. We want to... I doing? Cool. All right. All right. Cool. Our end goal is to pursue Christ. Along this process, we've got to remember that there's discipline. And so this morning, I definitely want to put this in a little bit of practice because our life hands on. And it actually kind of... Chick, chick. Perfect. Thank you. And so for this morning, um, I really want to put this into practice, and it's one of the most awkward things, but I think it's great, especially for the church body, right? I'm selling it really good. And so at this time, um, I would love for some instrumental music, and I want you to find maybe somebody that you don't really talk to in the church and ask them, hey, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? Again, we're talking about bearing each other one's burdens right? Pursuing that holiness, checking in on each other. How in the world can we be praying and interceding for you? And so this morning, before we close, I would love to take a moment to do that. Uh, So at this time, I would love for everyone to stand. Perfect. I'll try to be direct. (laughs) Now I would love for you to find somebody in the room. Um, Maybe that you don't really talk to. Maybe you do. I don't care. But I want to just be praying and interceding for each other. So now I want everybody to go find somebody and be willing to pray with them. Maybe it's somebody behind you. Maybe you can go out. Maybe ask the Lord, hey, who in the world can I be praying for, God? And go talk to him. All righty. If you would, just go ahead and have a seat. You don't have to go back to your original seats, but you can sit right where you are. We're going to show you a two-minute video, and I ask that you please Give it your attention. Just a second here. So we'll wait till everyone sit down, ready to go. Uh, you guys know Callan Campbell, right? Uh, he is uh, Sean and Elisa Campbell's son, and he is uh, a very special young man. The call of God is on his life, and he's pursuing that with all his heart, and no matter where it takes him. And uh, so it's, right now it's taking him to another part of the world where he's at. So let's go ahead and watch this video and see what he has to say. Hey church family, this is Callan Campbell, currently at my university here in Cuenca, Ecuador, where I've been studying abroad for the semester. Uh, Today I just wanted to share a little bit about the opportunity that I've been offered this summer. This summer I've been offered a position with Engineering Ministries International, or EMI, to work as an engineer for their fabrication shop ministries in Kampala, Uganda. EMI is a worldwide organization of engineers, architects, construction managers, and surveyors that is committed to seeing people restored by God and the world restored by design. The Uganda location is a fabrication shop that designs and builds different products to be installed in the local projects, ranging from anything as large as roof trusses to carpentry and cabinetry. My role in Uganda this summer will be serving as an apprentice under the process engineer of the fabrication shop. I will be a full-time worker while also having opportunities to serve in the local community and ministries in my free time. The fabrication shop is a really special place where national Ugandans from all levels of faith have encounters with Jesus and the gospel regularly and where salvations are not uncommon. I would like to personally thank all of you who have already committed to supporting me financially as well as through your prayers for this fast approaching summer missions opportunity. I am so excited to see how the Lord chooses to use me this summer and how he will guide my heart in considering the path of long-term mission work. If you would like to help support my missions internship financially, there's going to be a love offering collected at the end of service. If you'd like to give online, you can scan the QR code or grab a brochure on the way out that tells you a little bit more about EMI and also ways that you can be praying for me specifically. 
I hope to see most of you soon when I return from my semester abroad. But until then, God bless you and thank you. All right. Reason how he's talking so fast, I said, you got two minutes. So he had a lot of information in there. He's, he's a very eloquent young man. And, uh, but anyway, what we're going to do is, hey, today, right after we're done here, turn on the lights, we're going to go back there and have a wonderful, yummy taco meal. Uh, instead of paying for that meal, you, would you wouldn't mind if, if you want to put that money in a basket? And we're going to send that to him. I love the fact that, that we have several young men. Right now, we have uh, Dallas Baldwin with us. He's back from uh, college, and uh, he's going on to another trip as well. And he's going to be able to share some of that information later on. But I'm just saying I love the fact that we have young people leaving the place going into the field, going into what God has called them. Amen? And I think we should do everything we can to encourage that in the lives of people. How do you guys think about that? So, yes. Yeah, so, I, right after this, we're just going to dismiss you. But if you want to pay for the meal, we'll have a bucket for you or something like that. Go ahead and turn the lights on. He's right back there. Um, but uh, we're, we, you guys can put that money in there, and it'll go towards this right here. So, let's pray for our meal. So, you guys just go in there and just gum it all up. Okay, here we go. God, thank you for your word. Your word changes lives. Your word makes life not just bearable, but livable as victorious people, as victors in Jesus' name. So, Lord, I thank you for the word that's been given today. God, I ask for your blessings upon this food as we go in and in the fellowship that we have. I thank you for the new family members at Faith Outreach Center. And, God, we can't wait to see, as, as uh, was said on the video, we can't wait to see what you have in store for your church in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Amen. With that being said, uh, just let you know, Dan Ringen, he's been talking about, uh, he's been talking to several of you guys. Maybe you have a book of his. It's called the dinner church. The church is really seriously considering that, thinking about that, how we can see that happen here at Fulton County. And some of you may not know what I'm talking about, but you're going to hear a lot more about it later on. But what my point I'm making is Next Sunday, right after church, we're going to have a, those who are interested, Dan's going to lead a quick meeting for us in here. So just want to let you guys know that. All right, get your taco. God bless you, church. <laughs>